Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Seekers of the Supernatural. I'm your moderator, Tony Spera, along, of course, with hosts Ed and Lorraine Warren. You know, tonight, I think what we're going to do is talk about a case that's so famous that even today people speak about this case in Bridgeport. I've been on lectures with Ed and Lorraine, and people routinely come up to Ed and Lorraine and say, hey, Ed, Lorraine, what's it with Lindley Street in Bridgeport? Can you tell us about Lindley Street in Bridgeport? And that's 26 years ago, I believe. Mm -hmm. What we're going to do tonight is speak about 966 Lindley Street in Bridgeport, the phenomena that occurred there, a case that some called a hoax, particularly the commissioner of police, called this case a downright hoax. Ed Warren is here tonight, and Lorraine Warren is here tonight to dispute that, to tell you the absolute truth of their investigation, of what they found out. Through police reports, through their own eyewitness accounts, through other eyewitness accounts, what happened at 966 Lindley Street. So without any further ado, I think what we'd like to do is to start with whoever would like to begin first, mm -hmm. give us the background of the case. Welcome Art. tonight, by the way. Thank you, but Tony. If you can give us the summary of that case. All right. Um, it, it began in November of 1974. And that November day was a Sunday. And we were contacted by Mary Pascarella. Mary Pascarella lived in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. She was director of the Psychic Research Institute in Hamden, Connecticut. She was a personal friend of ours. She called, Ed took the call, and she said, Ed, you have got to meet me at this house. That particular day, Tony, was a day Ed had just come back from picking my mother up in uh, Bridgeport. His brother and sister-in-law were at the house. Now, what, when was this? What year was this? 1974, November of 1974. Okay. Um, Ed's mother had passed away only approximately 10 days before. There was never a grieving time. There was never a time to get together with the family. They held th the body while Ed and I drove home from West Virginia where we were at a university. And this was the first time now we were really together to sit down and relax with mm -hmm. everybody. And that's what we were doing and I was getting dinner ready. So Ed said to me, I will go down and see what this is all about. If there's anything at all to it, I will call <coughs> you. And he said, maybe you want to call Father Charbonneau mm -hmm. and bring him down. Well, that call came quite readily. The call came at approximately 5 after 11 that morning. Now, the reason I remember the time is because Ed said, how soon can you get down here? And when, when he said that, I said, I'm going to call Father Charbonneau, and when I did, he was in Mass, and he came down. We went into the house. By that time, when we entered that area, where you go over like the crest of a hill, I never seen so many police vehicles, fire department vehicles, people all surrounding it, like it was a crime area. Okay, let me just stop you right there for a second, Lorraine. Ed, what was in the house when you were there? What did well, you see when you first got there? Like Lorraine said, uh, when I came over that hill onto Lindley Street, I seen numerous police and fire department vehicles, already a crowd of probably 200 people. I went in the house, and here were police officers, firemen, uh, the Gooden family, neighbors, and it looked like somebody went through the house with a baseball bat just smashed things off of the walls, knocked furniture over. Everybody was talking excitedly about the things that they had witnessed. There was a police officer there. I said to him, did you see anything? I certainly did, he said, Mr. Warren. I seen that clock come off that, off that wall. He said, I seen those chairs in the living room topple over, move across the room. That was enough for me. I'm getting this from a police officer this man is a credible witness, so I start interviewing the family. I talked to Mr. and Mrs. Gooden first. I got all of the information from them, how it happened, when it started. It actually started on 
uh, Sunday or Saturday evening. They had come back from New York City. Mr. Gooden, Gerald Gooden, his wife, and their small daughter, the Marcy. The mother had gone into the kitchen. She was going to make a late supper for them. There's a large floor model television set right alongside the stove. All of a sudden, this thing started shaking, came right down onto her foot. It broke two of her toes. Well, another television set in Marcy's bedroom toppled off his shelf and fell onto the bed. Another television set, which was in the living room, toppled over and onto the floor. Now, one of the most fascinating things about the way things would fall, particularly the TV sets, was this heavy set would come down with a crash, but just before it hit the floor, it would hesitate and then hit. Never broke, never, never broke. smashed, wow. continually mm -hmm. worked. So I interviewed every police officer that was there, the neighbors, the Goodens. I have all of these interviews today, 26 years later. I have the police reports that they, they submitted at headquarters. Yeah, you have them right in the back here, I, I noticed. Yes, all of them are the, have the official seal of the Bridgeport Police Department. So, so the police officers, the patrolmen, saw phenomena happen, and they told you that, and they wrote this in well, the reports. Well, read one of those reports there, Tony. <clears throat> All right, I'll read one of the reports here. Now, this is dated from uh, November 25th, 1974. And it's, uh, here it says, it's, it's City of Bridgeport letterhead, and it says, to Captain Charles Baker, from Patrolman George F. Wilson, Jr., and it says, reference, strange occurrences at 966 Lindley Street. And it starts out, sir, I was on patrol in A23 and went over to cover G35 on an unknown call at 966 Lindley Street. Upon my arrival, we found the inside of the house looking as though someone had completely ransacked it. Mm -hmm. We were then advised by the people that strange things were happening, furniture moving, things falling from the walls, etc. At this time, I entered the kitchen and saw the refrigerator actually leave the floor approximately six to eight inches and moved towards me a couple of feet. I then went into the living room and saw a chair bounce around. I at this time attributed these strange things to something natural such as gas or termites. So I called the radio room to send some inspectors from the fire department to check the house. The fire department arrived, checked the house and stated there was nothing wrong with the house that they could find and they left. I was in and out of the house all day for different reasons and spent approximately four hours total in the house. During this time, I observed several strange things happen. Of these were the following. I saw a large TV slowly make a 90 degree turn away from us and face a wall. A bureau bounced on the floor a, cu a couple of times. A crucifix nailed to the wall vibrate and pull itself off the wall. Um, a picture on the wall fell and nearly struck my partner, Patrolman Leroy Lawson. Three different reclining chairs bounced around, changing positions in the room. And a large clock on a shelf in the kitchen f uh, fall to the floor. And the last sentence is, all of the proceeding is what I actually saw inside of 966 Lindley Street, respectfully submitted Patrolman George F. Wilson, Jr. Tony, read, read Lawson. Is this Lawson's <coughs> report? Uh, the next report is uh, also a police report by, this is interesting. by a patrolman. It says to Captain Baker uh, from patrolman Leroy Lawson, and then the subject, it says, Haunted House. Mm -hmm. Sir, while on patrol in car A23, my partner and I went to 966 Lindley Street to cover G35. Upon entering the house, I saw a picture fall off the wall, a small desk move, and a clock on the kitchen wall fall. I immediately left the house <laughs> and waited outside for my partner. <laughs> Respectfully submitted Patrolman Leroy Lawson and uh, same date on it. Yes, I have, the reason I <coughs> wanted you so, to read it. These patrolmen saw this stuff happen. Now, and I also know that you said, Lorraine, that these patrolmen, when they saw the priest later, mm -hmm. what did they do? Everyone but one man I don't know who the one man was, but he was corrected by his officer, the lieutenant that was there. Every one of these police officers, when myself and the priest walked in, they knelt 
down and asked for the priest's blessing. They're they asked for his blessing. Yes. Their guns, Tony, their nightsticks, nothing could help them against the forces that they were witnessing in that house. They were frightened, and they wanted the priest to bless them. That man, Lawson, I never, ever, I, I long since forgot him. And Ed and I are coming out of a medical building a few months ago, and he said to Ed and I, he's retired now, he's working as a guard at a medical building, and he looked at Ed and I and said, Lindley Street, Bridgeport. Wow. And I walked up and on, <coughs> on his shirt was it said, it said Lawson? Leroy Lawson. And I was. I want to say like, hi to Leroy out there. Hi, just, Leroy. I was very there. impressed meeting him after all these years. I like years. to say that I know patrolmen are credible people. And I know because I used to be a police officer years ago. I know that when they see something and they document it, they're not making this up when they when they do a police report you know they can get fired or arrested for making a false statement to mm -hmm. to their police department so i know these are legitimate these are legitimate reports now ed you said to me that the patrolman believed it. the patrolman saw it the patrolman are honorable honorable but what did you tell me about the chief all right uh, i think all the problem came in because of the fact that we had between 10 and 15 thousand people in that area they had barricades set up. One bus load of police officers would get out, another would get in. They had 24-hour shifts around the clock. I knew this wasn't going to last. Lorraine and I were in that house for almost three days and nights. We watched as furniture moved around, smashed, broke. People came in and witnessed this, firemen, priests. What annoyed me was the fact that on that third night, we went home, we had to take our showers, get something to eat, get some clean clothes. In the morning, on the, on the radio, was it was a hoax. The little girl did it. A 90-pound, 10-year-old child could move a 450-pound refrigerator two feet away from us, and we wouldn't see how she did it. Police officers seen it. They experienced it. They wrote down the reports. But... Chief Walsh, who was a superintendent at that time, made it his business to make sure that he was going to call that a hoax. He called up the media, told them that the little girl was a ventriloquist, that it was her that was projecting this voice around the cat, that both Father Charbonneau and I and other investigators and people heard. This is a materialized larynx, which usually occurs in what we call poltergeist cases. Now, I understand why he called it a hoax, to get rid of 15,000 people. He had to take the barricades down. And he told the Goodens that night, through a detective and two patrolmen, that he would pull all of his men out of there. They would take down the barricades and let the crowds do what they wanted if they did not go along with his idea about a hoax. They went along with it, but three months later, they appeared on Tiny Markle Show, which was a talk show in Bridgeport, Connecticut. On that show, they spoke about the police officers coming in and telling them that they had to call it a hoax. But the media never followed up on that. What happened here was the media said that the little girl did it, the parents did it. I want to clear these people's names today. I believe that Chief Walsh, who was the chief of police in Bridgeport at that time should be man enough to come forward 26 years later and say, yes, it wasn't a hoax. I had men go in there. I had them confront the Goodens to say that it was a hoax to get rid of all those people. He not only made fools out of the family and us, he made fools out of his own men. These police officers were hourly going into the media, which were all around the house, in the house, telling them about the things that they experienced. Now, on one occasion, I was standing in the kitchen. Father Charbonneau, a Catholic priest, was right near the bedroom, which was only maybe 14 feet away from where I was. <clears throat> there were three police officers, Lorraine, the Gooden family, were all standing around. Suddenly, when I was talking, 
I noticed that there was a movement from my peripheral vision on the sink. A set of Malmac dishes flew across the room and landed on the floor. The television set, which many times went over in the kitchen, suddenly went over. The television set in the girls' room, which we put up on a shelf many times, came down again. A crucifix, which was on a wall, was made of plastic, just burst. This was one incident. Didn't you say that somebody, well, I don't know if it was the chief or not, said about you giving the girl a special lifesaver? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. What happened there? I had yeah. lifesavers in my pocket. I took the lifesavers out. I took one, and little Marcy Gooden was looking at me. Was I not going to offer this child a lifesaver? <laughs> so you offered her a lifesaver. Here, Marcy. Later on, the chief of police told the Goodens that I gave her some kind of magic candy that would put her into a trance and that I could go up into Monroe, Connecticut and control her from my house 20 some miles away and that I could move all these things in the house. If I could do that, Tony, I would be the one that would be getting the write up, not oh, really? the Goodens. Yeah, you'd be like a magician. It was, it was ridiculous, but I wish this man would come forward and tell the truth. I mean, I know he's an old guy today. What has he got to lose? Chief, come forward, tell the truth after all these years. You've made fools out of your own men. You've made fools out of us. All the investigators that went in there, the firemen, Chief Swirling of the fire department, walked in there and seen three huge reclining chairs jumping around and piling up on top of each other. Reporters went in there, seen things, heard things. I have all of these accounts. I have all the interviews on have, tape, just as I have, did 26 years ago. You have audio tape of the police officers? I don't have audio. I have vi uh, the video. No, yeah, I do have audio. audio. I don't have any videotape. No, there was no video then. But there were the so many witnesses to this experience, which I think was probably the most important poltergeist case to come along in 100 years. All right, I was going to say. It was a poltergeist case. It yes. was a poltergeist case. What is a poltergeist? Tell, well, I guess tell the audience. Poltergeist is a German word. It means mischievous and noisy ghosts. But there are many different types of poltergeists. We have water poltergeists. We have fire poltergeists, punching poltergeists, throwing poltergeists. The ones that most people hear about are when the stones fall out of the sky and onto a dwelling. Mm -hmm. These probably make the paper once a week someplace in the United States. All right, so... Any idea why this occurred at 966 Lenten Street? Well, Street? there was, it, Marcy was an adopted child. Mm -hmm. She was adopted by Gerald and Laura Gooden from Canada. But it is known that at the time that they adopted her, that strange things were happening in the home where she lived. She was part of a very large family. And that they would tie her to a chair so were poltergeist things occurring around this child? All right, now this child moved. She had only really been there with the family about a year at that time, if I recollect that right. And things began to occur. Things began to occur, Tony, months before. But what it was was tapping on the outside of the building. So they felt that that was vandals that were doing it. And a police officer who lived across the street from them would come over at times to try to understand it, but he also witnessed it, and nobody, absolutely nobody was there. So when this final major explosion started on this Sunday, when all of this stuff began, that was the first time. I can only tell you what the lifestyle was like in that home. It was an extremely small, extremely cramped home. They, they treated this little girl, they felt in a loving way, but they protected her from any outside friends, any outside interest. She went to St. Patrick's School, the mother would take her, then she ran into all sorts of ridicule because they said she was different and she felt she was different. Uh, because she was an Indian child. And then it, when it came recess, the mother wanted to protect her then. And she would go down and take the little child out of the recess yard and walk her around until it was time to go back into school again. Hmm. She did not ever have the opportunity of interreacting with other children except in a classroom setting. 
So they were strange in that way. And through the frustrations of this child, who, because of the fact that, that certain girls mature earlier, and I believe she was, that she was reaching puberty where her frustrations and her anxieties concerning her life in that home were probably responsible for triggering off what was happening there. And there were strange <coughs> things bef before that. They had a son, uh, Gerald and Laura. Uh, Laura had a natural son that was born with Down syndrome. They, he died, that little boy died. Then they had another boy and they put him up for adoption, but they adopted this little girl. Nobody ever knows and was never answers for that. There is always reasons behind poltergeist phenomena, Tony. There's reasons really behind a lot of hauntings. If you can really get into the background of the family, it helps you to better understand why forces that are that powerful, invisible forces, can create what happened at 966 Lindley Street. Does the little girl have anything to do with the phenomena at all? We know that children in puberty, especially girls, that they have so much energy that we refer to as supernatural or preternatural phenomena can't take place around these children. Now, parapsychologists would claim that PK, psychokinetic energy, emanating from the child, PK rods would move these objects. Well, I don't go along with that. First of all, they say it's 14 feet away that it can be moved. Marcy Gooden was miles away from that house when things were smashing and breaking in the home itself. The first thing I do upon going into any poltergeist case is have the child removed. I have the family removed. Then I use religious provocation. I provoke what's there. Nobody's in the house but myself and investigators. Things are moving and smashing and breaking. What does that have to do with PK, psychokinetic energy? We do know that the energy from the child is used. It's a fuel that what we refer to as the poltergeist uses. Marcy Gooden was not responsible for anything that happened in that house. A child might take a pillow and throw it across a room. That would be it. But not remember that thing. many officers were watching as Marcy Gooden was in a heavy chair and that chair and the child went flying across the room. A police officer weighing over 200 pounds sat in a chair and couldn't do it. A priest got in the chair. He was a man over 160, 70 pounds. He couldn't move the chair. How could a 90 pound child move that chair? Well, now remember, Tony, it isn't that it's consciously, it is not consciously being done. Once it is triggered off, through these frustrations and through these anxieties, then spirits do come in. Demonic spirits had to be responsible for such power that went on in that home. And it was tremendous power that, to move what was moved so in that house. Is that the most famous case in uh, Is that the most famous case in I would in have Connecticut? to say that that was probably the most famous case in 100 years because mm -hmm. of the amount of witnesses Mm -hmm. I mean, you didn't have three or four people. You no. had dozens of no, people. No, such credible that witnesses. before the outbreak and even after the outbreak had seen things occurring. This was still going on three months later when the Goodens mm -hmm. went on WICC uh, with Tiny Markle. Mm -hmm. They told how just before they left that a sewing machine was moving across the room and they wired it to the wall and it broke the wires. Jeez. This is right on the radio This made show. national headlines, didn't it? In, it was top international news story for 48 hours, Tony. It really was. Top international news story. stop to think story. about this, Tony. Something invisible, something intangible comes into your home. It smashes and breaks and even burns. Lorraine received burns in that house. It was just like somebody said. That's got to be scary. It's it is scary. scary. It's, scary. it's, it's very scary. Something invisible is attacking your house. Yes. And maybe you, right? Yes. Could attack you too, right? Yes. And people have been slashed. People have been punctured. People have been thrown across rooms. People have been killed. What we call a fire poltergeist can kill. I know they're probably showing a picture right now of the uh, Lindley Street house over there. Yes. It's just a little, little, tiny little house, isn't it? Tiny, oh. It's like a cottage. It's so tiny. And that's why it's a shotgun so house down in the south. 
Pardon? Like a shotgun house in a sock. That's so, right. You could shoot a shotgun right through it. Yes, well. that and you could. You, you know? could. It's very, 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 very yeah, small. Like that. That's it, why the vibrations built up so quickly in there. Yeah. And you made that comment that if you turn that nine around, yes. a nine six six, you have six six six. You have six 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 Lindley Street. Yeah. It's amazing. Tony, that case was as real as you are. That case stands out in my mind in the annals of psychic research as one of the most powerful one of, of the most uh, credible cases of poltergeist activity ever recorded. And it was recorded. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate the information. Same. I'm sure the audience does, too, because everybody asks us. Yes. They ask you especially about 966 Lindley Street. Mm -hmm. We don't have a lot of time left. I'd like to wrap it up by saying Well, that. I'd like to say one more thing. Go ahead, Ed. Go right ahead. Superintendent Walsh, 26 years has passed. Come forward and clear your men, clear us, and the Gooden family. Tell the truth about what happened on the third night in that home. You don't have to worry about crowds anymore. They're all gone. Right. Well, there you have it. The challenge, the gauntlet has been thrown out. Mm. 966 Lindley Street, hoax or reality? We say it's a reality. For Ed Warren, for Lorraine Warren, for all the camera crew, for Charter Communications, we're going to see you again next week. I'm Tony Spera. Good night.